live. So good uh, morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We're really excited today for our speaker, and I will get to them in just a minute. But right now, we are joined by six classes from across North America, and I really do mean all across North America today, which is awesome. So I want to give them a chance to say a little bit of a hello. So we've got Miss McDonald's grade three fours in Lethbridge in Alberta. Hi, guys. Hi, <laughs> welcome in. I love when the enthusiasm screws up the mic when people are screaming so loud, it like cuts it out. That's awesome. <laughs> we got Miss Pops, Pops Michelle's, uh, grade fours in Roscoe in Illinois. Hi, guys. <laughs> hey, welcome in. Yes, why is it whenever we get Illinois, they're always so excited, it's awesome. We've got Mr. Lindmark's grade fours also in Illinois in Canton. So welcome in, guys. Guys. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> We've got Miss uh, Tutangi's grade one through threes in Snohomish in Washington. Let's pull their mic up. Hi, guys. Hi. There's so many of you. I love it. All right. Welcome in. We've got Miss Steinhoff's grade fours in Guelph in Ontario. Let me pull them. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey! <laughs> Who needs a projector when you can crowd around the screen? And then last but not least, we've got Miss Teeson's grade fours in Surrey in British Columbia. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome in. Awesome. All right. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all joining us is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Raleigh, North Carolina by Martha at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science. And so they're going to walk us through a little bit about fossil discovery, how do fossils get made, learn a little bit about dinosaurs, all sorts of amazing stuff about the ancient creatures that used to roam our world and dominate the earth. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so much for joining us, guys, and take it away. We are happy to be here with all of you this afternoon. We are standing in front of one of our exhibits that we have at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. This is the Acrocanthosaurus atacensis, high-spined lizard. This is one of our largest dinosaurs on display here at the museum. And so some of what we are going to talk about today is how have we learned about dinosaurs through the fossils that we have discovered? And how do you, maybe as a visitor, when you come to see some of them in museums, how can you tell them apart from each other? So hopefully you will pick up on some clues and tips while we are talking about these different things during our program that will help you when you are a visitor at some of the museums that are nearby you. And before I walk over to our desk, I will point out my favorite things about the acro. First, it's this really high spine that you can see behind me. That's a really interesting feature of this particular theropod dinosaur. And also we like to point out the number of fingers that theropod dinosaurs have, because that's one of the clues that can help you tell this one apart from a lot of the other Tyrannosaurus rex dinosaur skeletons that are super popular and that everybody knows a lot about. So you can keep an eye on spines, and on fingers and also even on the skull. You can check that out when you are visiting places near you. And I have one person to introduce to you today. Luca Rolleri is gonna join us today later as our, come on aboard Luca Rolleri. He is gonna join us later. He is one of our other museum educators and paleontology volunteers. And so he is going to be our question and answer expert later, this, later on in our program. So we're really happy that Luca could join us today gonna be fun. <laughs> so I'm gonna walk over to my other area in the studio and start showing you some of our favorite specimens. Very cool. So now I'm sitting in front of a picture of the Museum of Natural Sciences and we have two wings and we're in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the capital of North Carolina. And we do have lots of different dinosaurs on display and we have paleontology researchers that are doing work all around North Carolina and in other parts of the world, like in South Africa. Some of our team is in Thailand right now. And so we have lots of these research specimens on display and also on display in a window that you can actually see them at work. So when we are talking about the dinosaurs, I can give you just a question that you can be thinking about. You don't have to answer right now. Are dinosaurs still alive? Thinking. Maybe yes, maybe no. Hmm. It depends on what kind of dinosaur that you mean, right? But in general, most dinosaurs did go extinct at the end of this era. And this is, I'm going to show you a picture now. When we talk about most of the dinosaurs, 
we are talking about a time period on Earth called the Mesozoic Era, the Age of Reptiles. And it includes a really long time on Earth. So dinosaurs were really successful and survived some pretty big changes over the course of the history of the Earth during the time that they were living. But these are the three general periods, Triassic, Jurassic, and the Cretaceous period. And Jurassic might be a, a familiar word to you if you have liked any of the Jurassic Park or Jurassic World books or movies. And so that's kind of where that terminology comes from. This, these are the science words that we use to describe the time period when dinosaurs kind of ruled the earth when they were alive. If you were thinking of how do we know that they were all over the place, here's the other map that's really fun to show you. And this is an updated map. And you can look up specific groups of dinosaurs. We are finding things all the time on a regular basis now, new fossils. All of these dots represent places where dinosaurs have been found. So lots of different types of dinosaur groups. You can see some parts of the world have a lot more fossils than in other parts of the world, just relating to dinosaurs. If I was to add in fossils of all living things and prehistoric things, the whole map would be covered in dots, but we're just talking about dinosaurs for this particular map. And then we know that Earth has changed. Earth is changing today, and Earth has been through really major drastic changes over its history. And so we're going to go through a few slides that show you how Earth looked when the dinosaurs were alive. So here's our first picture. This should look familiar, right? This is our Earth today. But then if you go back 220 million years ago, you have the Triassic period, and the continents look pretty different than how they are today. Then about 180 million years ago, you have the early Jurassic. It's maybe starting to look a little bit more familiar. And then you have the late Cretaceous, which is about 80 million years ago. So we recognize the shapes of these continents, even though there is water in places where we definitely do not have water today. So we were saying that dinosaurs were really successful as a creature when they lived on Earth. They were really well adapted and survived and lived in a variety of habitats and ecosystems. Why did they die out? Why did most of them die out? And this was a question, you know, people maybe for 200 years have really been formally naming dinosaurs. And so people have been discovering dinosaurs and fossils for as long as people have been on the earth. They just didn't always know what they were or how they related to each other and how they related to other things found in other parts of the world. But now we know, and, and we know also why most of them went extinct. And we're even finding out even more specific details to that question. And the biggest answer is an asteroid, right? There was an asteroid that hit this part of Mexico and it's called, it left a huge crater, Chicxulub Crater. And this is pretty much what did in the dinosaurs. This is why they went extinct. Some really major environmental changes that harmed the food cycle and really created an unhos unhospitable world for the dinosaurs. And here's a little illustration of maybe what that might've looked like. And then when you're thinking about fossils forming, so here's this big event where this thing comes out of the sky and it causes fire and really massive flooding and all of these big changes. We know this because we find fossils, right? And we find them in lots of different places. And so that's our next kind of thought process is we know what caused this big extinction event. And now we know how we gotta be thinking about how do these fossils form? We haven't found everything that ever lived. We've just found small fragments of things that have lived in different places. And that's because fossil formation as a process does not happen everywhere, every time. So we kind of joke, step one in fossilization, what has to happen? Step one is a plant or animal has to die first, right? And then the step two is really the important part is that it has to be covered really quickly. And usually it's covered by water that's carrying sediments and those form a protective layer on top of these plants and animals that died. So that keeps them from decomposing and getting dragged away by lots of other animals or by other running water or even just by insects, other animals. So being covered by sediment is what keeps the bone from disappearing. And then millions of years of sediments, imagine how heavy that is and how much pressure that creates. It changes the bone and makes it more like a rock and less like the bones of living creatures. And we have a huge variety and diversity of size and sample. So here's our first picture. 
You might have seen this picture before. It's just such a fun picture. We really love to share it. It's an Argentinosaurus femur bone. And you all can be thinking to yourselves in your classroom, where is your femur? I can see you, so point to where your femur is. Oh yeah, everybody's doing the right general direction. Yeah, okay. So your femur is your thigh bone, right? That's your largest, strongest bone in your body. And so when we see a femur of this size, as in the Argentinosaurus picture, we know that this was a really large dinosaur. And we can kind of see where the other parts would relate to each other and how this size might relate to another type of dinosaur. Argentinosaurus is a long neck dinosaur, a sauropod. So that was the largest dinosaurs. So these are really fun and really important in size and everybody gets excited about seeing really big fossils. But there are some scientists who are focusing, and actually everybody does, because this helps you see what was going on in the ecosystem around the bigger feature. We are looking at the really teeny tiny fossils too, these micro fossils. And so these are pictures or images and parts of teeth of sharks and small clams and mussels and tiny vertebrae of fish. And when we find this in the middle of a desert, because a lot of the places where fossils are found now are really dry and arid areas. If we find the parts of animals that live in water, we know that there used to be water there during the time of that living fossil, when that animal was still alive. So microfossils are equally important. They are just as important as the large fossils. So this is my next fun thing to share with you. One of the things as a naturalist, because that's what I do for my job, where I learn about lots of different kinds of topics and I get to share them with all of you. I think it's really fun as a scientist who's focusing on these prehistoric animals and plants. A lot of it is learning to recognize shapes and how they relate to each other. And so I have three, three objects here, three different bones. And so when we are talking about body systems and anatomy, we are comparing how things are similar and how things are different. And so do you know what part of the body these three bones might come from? They might come from, do you want to take a, a let someone take a guess? Yeah, I can certainly, okay. so let me give you the class. So Mr. Lindmark's class, uh, what do you guys think? Where do you think those bones come from? Head. 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 So they are actually vertebrae bones. So your spine bones, right? And these are three bones. They're all vertebrae bones, but they are from three different kinds of animals. And so the shape of a vertebrae bone is fairly similar amongst animals with backbones, but there's some slight differences. So this is from a deer, like a deer that you and I could see today. So that's a backbone shape of a deer. This is actually from a whale and this is a fossil. So a lot of the parts have broken off and been weathered away. And then this is actually a catfish. So they're all vertebrae bones, but they look different from each other. And I wanted to point this out to you because when paleontologists are finding the bones of animals, they are able to recognize what part of the body it came from. And then they're also able to recognize, does this look like something that we already have in our collections or is this something brand new based on measurements and comparisons? Those are back bones. Let me show you two other bones and let you take a guess. All right, here are two bones. What part of the body do you think these bones are from? They're All the right. same kind of bone, two different dinosaurs. Yeah, Miss Teason's class, how about you guys? What do you think? Oh, your name, so you're naming a kind of thing, but what, what part of the body do you think those bones come from? Oh, yeah, so you guys are on the right track. These are actually toe bones. So think of the size of the bones in your feet and think of how big a dinosaur must be if this is just one of the bones in its feet. Okay, so, whoops, I just lost one off the table. That's fine. <laughs> they are replicas. So I don't have to worry about breaking irreplaceable fossils. So toe bone is another really great unique shape that you can see and know that this is a toe bone. Is it something I know or is this from a new animal? So comparative anatomy, comparing how animal parts are working in the animal and how they allow us to tell them apart from each other. So one more bone is this one. And this is a femur. And I was gonna show you just, it's really interesting to look at it up close. 
Usually when the fossils are weathering out of the rock where they are found, the rock matrix, they're often a different color than the rock that they are found in. And sometimes they are in this beautiful shape and we can tell what kind of bone they are even if they are in the rock. But sometimes they are scattered about and all we find are these little fragments. And we know that they are bone, but we know we don't know exactly what they came from. So this is a femur because all femurs have a general shape. And this one was actually broken in a few places. You can see kind of the spots where it was cracked. And they do fix fossils with glue. Just like if you and I break something, we use glue. They just use a special kind of glue for fossils. So here are the bone fragments. If you and I were looking for fossilized bones, we would be looking for these teeny tiny little holes. So if we zoom in to these holes, you can see it almost looks like a sponge in this inner layer. And it's got an outer layer of bone and an inner layer of bone. Rocks do not look like this. And then some paleontologists will also tell you, I don't recommend that you do this walking around sticking things on your tongue, but some paleontologists will say, if you wanna know if it's, if it's a bone, you just stick it on your tongue to see if it makes contact like if it was a sponge. Not recommended, but you know, just a little trick of the trade. So sometimes lots of fragments can be really interesting and good practice and you know that then there's a spot that you can be looking for more bones. And then sometimes you get really lucky and you find these really complete skeletons or really good examples of bones of something new. And so that leads me to our next picture because we do have paleontologists who are I remember we were saying they're exploring North Carolina and all around the world in different places. And so there are new discoveries of fossils being made. And if you come to see us in Raleigh or if you get to go and visit a museum near you, you might see some new specimens and new discoveries on display as well. This is one of the new dinosaurs that's been recently named at the museum, Moros Intrepidus. It looks a lot like a Tyrannosaurus rex, just miniature. And Moros Intrepidus, the scientific name, translates to the harbinger of doom because it lives before Tyrannosaurus rex appears on Earth. So it is a type of Tyrannosaur dinosaur. It's just much smaller and appears earlier. So that's kind of a fun thing to talk about when you talk about science as well, is that we're coming up with these new names of creatures and it's where they're found, features about that animal. Sometimes you just get to be creative and, and make a a story with the discovery that you have as well. And so before we finish up, because I know we're almost at 20 minutes, it goes by so fast. I wanted to show a video, share a video with you, and it's, it'll just finish us up right at that mark. And it talks about what our paleontologists are doing. And so you'll have a chance to meet some of them and see some of the places that they go. And then we'll have chance, a time for Q and A. So here are our paleontologists going on an expedition. We're in this area, um, sort of in the central part of Utah. And the reason we're here is there's a very thin, narrow strip of rocks that are about 98 million years old. And it's a time period we don't know anything about the dinosaurs that were living here. So we came out here specifically just to excavate and prospect that little thin area of rock. Yeah, this is one of my favorite places to come. Utah is an absolutely beautiful state. And all throughout, there are, there are sites that you can go and dig for dinosaurs, dig for other fossils. It's one of the best places in the world to come for fossils. So day one, we haul a lot of gear out to the site. We haul uh, picks and shovels, and it's amazing. In paleontology, we use a range from a dental pick all the way up to a 60-pound jackhammer. And sometimes we flip between those pretty rapidly. So we'll be jackhammering for a day. We'll take off all the overburden. We'll be crack hammering with giant chisels. We'll find a bone. Everybody slows down. So we use smaller hammers. We use finer chisels to move rock that's close to the bone so that we can see what's actually in the quarry itself. Um, and we don't want to use a big pickaxe, you know, right next to the actual fossil because you don't want to damage anything. So we think of fossils as data, right? They're not just pretty things to look at. Um, where they came out of the ground is very important um, because it can tell you a lot about the animal, how it died, what kind of environment it was in. You're looking for the story behind the bones. And a large part of that story comes from the geology. So we go to a site, we find the bones, we see what kind of sediment it's in. It can, is this a lake? Is it an ocean? Was it deposited in a river, very far away from a river? What part of the skeleton it's from, whether it's a vertebra, whether it's a limb bone, whether it's a claw or a toe bone. When we're getting a specimen ready for transport, 
we can't just take it out of the ground and put it in a truck and bring it back because it's too fragile. We uncover the surface of the bone and leave it in the ground. We don't take it out of the ground right away. And then we'll mix up some plaster in water and cut burlap strips. We'll dunk those in and cover that whole uh, specimen encased in rock and plaster. And we'll undercut it and flip it over and jack it the other side and it's all ready to go back to the museum. Once we excavate things and we wrap them in plaster and burlap jackets, we then have to haul them all the way back to the vehicles. We will strap it down with ratchet straps down to a backboard or a sled and get a bunch of people around it and carry it together in unison back to camp. If we have a really heavy jacket and we can't drive up to the location, there's only one way to get it out of there and, and that's using a helicopter lift and that can get pretty expensive too. All right, so you got both of us on screen now. And so <laughs> this is your chance to ask some questions, some paleontology questions about things you've always wanted to know or things that we showed you today. And um, we're ready to continue with that part of our program. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much for a delightful presentation as always, guys. Um, so in addition to our live classes, we've also got three groups, Ms. Howard, Ms. Paulson, and Mr. Hancock's class watching from Ontario and uh, British Columbia online. So if you guys want to type in questions in the YouTube chat bar, I'll happily pass along as many as we can. But let's dive in. So Ms. McDonald's class, if you guys want to come up and kick us off, you are demuted. Go for it. What was the first dinosaur to die? The first dinosaur to die? So the first dinosaurs that we have fossils of, like the earliest dinosaurs, um, are a lot of small meat-eating dinosaurs, mostly from South America. Um, one of them is called Eoraptor, which means dawn thief. Um, another is Herrerasaurus, which means Herrera's lizard. It was, na and it was named after the paleontologist who first found it. Um, they were some of the first dinosaurs to ever appear. Um, the last dinosaurs to live on the planet are the really famous ones like Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, and Kylosaurus. Um, and they lived about 66 million years ago. And they were the last of the non-avian dinosaurs to um, survive. And they saw the asteroid hit and yeah. Very cool. I also, sorry, you mentioned T-Rex, and I love highlighting for classes that we are closer in time to Tyrannosaurus than Tyrannosaurus was to Stegosaurus. So many people lump dinosaurs together, but... Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's, it's a yeah. mind, mind boggling. We call it deep time. Deep time can be kind of hard to comprehend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, all right, uh, Ms. Postuschel's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Loud. How long does it take to get um, plaster on a big fossil? <laughs> no, that's a really, really good question. Um, on a really, really big fossil, it could. So when we, so what we do is when we're in the field and we have uncovered the the fossil and we're ready to put the plaster on it is kind of time constrained. So we mix up this giant vat of plaster, and then we have burlap strips that we're soaking in the plaster and putting over the bone. It, but the thing is the plaster, um, it dries really quickly. And so it's really a team effort because we need to get all that plaster on with it in a few minutes so that it doesn't dry up and we can still get it all nice and spread on. For a really, really big fossil, we're gonna be making multiple um, Batches. multiple batches of plaster and so it could take and then we're also going to put multiple a bunch of different layers on it because we want to really protect the fossil during transport so depending on the size of the fossil it could take a few minutes to maybe 30 45 minutes mixing all the batches together and putting on all the layers very cool all right uh let's head to mr lindmark's class if you guys have one go for it what is the rarest fossil you guys found? The rare, that's a really good question. So here at the museum, probably the rarest fossil we have is the one Martha was talking about, Moros. Um, Dr. Zano found the bones of Moros back in 2012. And so far, the leg, uh, the, it's an almost complete leg and some claws and teeth of Moros. And those are the only fossils 
we have of that dinosaur. No one else has found any Moros bones that we know of. Um, as far as just in general, a lot of dinosaurs, so the process of fossilization is really, really rare. Like it needs the, it needs very precise, particular um, things to happen for a bone to turn into a fossil. And because of that, fossilization as a whole is pretty rare. And we have a lot of dinosaurs where they're only known from one or two bones. So overall, finding a dinosaur is is super rare. Um, that actually is a nice segue into a class, uh, a question from a class on YouTube. So Madame Howard's class in Ottawa wanted to ask, so other than dinosaurs, is there another rare specimen you have? Is there anything of another kind of creature uh, from other periods of history that's really unique that you guys have at the museum? Yeah, so um, one of, we have a few, so here in North Carolina, we have a lot of um, Triassic and Pleistocene era fossils. So um, at the very, very beginning of the dinosaurs and way after the dinosaurs, like in the last ice age. So the Triassic um, dinosaurs, weren't really dominant at that point. They were still kind of in the shadows, biding their time, waiting for like a good moment to, you know, um, to diversify. And most of the dominant life forms during the Triassic were crocodilians and these animals called dicynodonts, which were therapsids. Um, we don't have any we don't, have any models, we don't have any models of them right now, <laughs> but one fossil that we have found in North Carolina from the Triassic is one called Postosuchus alisone. Um, and Postosuchus is really cool. Its name means post crocodile. Uh, post is a place, if I believe, if I remember correctly, it's a place in Texas where the very first fossils of it were found. And then Alisone um, gives credit to the scientist who found the, one of the scientists who found the remains. And Postosuchus Alisone is really cool because it's a giant crocodile-like predator that was living here. And so, and not a dinosaur, even though it looked a lot like a dinosaur. And then on the other end of the spectrum, during the Pleistocene, the Pleistocene was only about, it ended only about 10,000 years ago. So really, really, rel in the big picture of time, really, really rel recent. And we have mastodons and um, Arematherium, which is a giant ground sloth that was living in North Carolina. And we actually have the fossils of both of those on display at our museum. This is Arematherium, the giant ground sloth. Uh, so yeah, we have we have a lot of really cool fossils in North Carolina, and some of the fossil deposits haven't been that well explored, but they're starting to be. So um, we're going to be learning a lot more about North prehistoric North Carolina. And something fun to point out with fossil discovery that is sort of a joke that I had recently heard was that in North Carolina we have so many trees. So we don't have these large areas of expa uh, exposed earth like in Utah and Montana. And so it's not easy to find them. They're there, they're just covered. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, um, so, yeah that's a fun, fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's a thing in the Eastern United States, we have our big forests and we have a lot of cities and everything. So it's harder to find fossils, um, fossils except in a few areas. Um, New Jersey is really popular. Um, that was actually one of the first, the very first dinosaur to ever be found in the United States was found in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Very cool, guys. And you actually answered a question from a group on YouTube, too, where they asked, why were there so many gaps in the, in the map of the world? Oh, good. Okay. So many places like Antarctica that would have so many fossils, but we just don't have the resources to get beneath the ice or beneath the forest or beneath the deserts to see they're them. They're covered. Yes, they're covered. We do have some fossils from Antarctica, though. Um, we have Cryolophosaurus, which means a uh, frozen crested lizard, because Antarctica. Uh, it lived in the early Jurassic. We also have an ankylosaur called Antarctica pelta. Um, and so we do have some fossils from, uh, from, um, Antarctica, which makes sense because, you know, back during the dinosaur times, it wasn't a frozen wasteland right. there. It was more, um, uh, it was a more temperate climate, but the only parts that we're able to get fossils from are kind of like, you know, those really coastal areas where you can actually see the rock. Yeah. Um, I want to turn it back to our classes in just a second, but two more things to riff off of what you guys showed. For one, I don't know how many classes really paid attention that that sloth was as large as a tree, uh, but some of the animals that existed even 10,000 years ago were wild, like armadillos bigger than cars. You have saber-toothed cats that are twice the size of a lion, like it's an incredible period in the world history. Um, and you guys have hinted at deep time twice now. 
So I love this analogy for classes. If you if you stretch your arms out from one end to the other, and the you know end of your left fingertips is the beginning of you know life on Earth, uh, human history, all of humanity could be shaved off in like your far right middle fingernail. Like we are so small in the scheme of of life on Earth. It's so fantastic. Um, so great, guys. All right, um, Mr. Tongi's class. Let's head to Washington. If you guys have a question, go for it. We don't have. Um, yeah, talk really loud. How many species of mammals were alive during the time of the dinosaurs? Good question. How many species of mammals were alive during the time of the dinosaurs? So that's actually a really, really interesting question. <laughs> so mammals evolved really relatively early um, during, like the first mammals I believe are found during the Triassic. And for a really long time, we thought they were not very diverse. They were just kind of like small true like things living in the shadows of dinosaurs and for a really long time that's the only fossils that we had but recently especially in china um china has these beautifully preserved fossils and of fe that showed feathers on dinosaurs but also a lot of mammals and what we found is that mammals were actually much more diverse during the time of dinosaurs than we originally thought they weren't just the small insectivorous insect eating shrew shrew like things we also had some herbivorous ones we had some um, amphibious ones so living near water we had gliders kind of like modern day sh um, modern day sugar gliders um, so you think like 10 yeah. species, 20 species? There was, honest, there was probably several hundred species oh, of wow. mammals. Like they were much more diverse than we originally thought. The only thing, and once flowering plants started to evolve, we started to get mammals that were adapted to eat seeds and flowers and things like that. Um, the only thing that really kept, and some, were, and some weren't even that small, some were the size of like a badger, which if anybody's ever seen a badger, that's like, that's surprisingly big animal yeah. um <laughs> but it wasn't until the dinosaurs became extinct that they were able to expand into areas like horses um as large herbivores or whales in the ocean or you know humans coming down from trees very cool guys um i love that you mentioned the number of species and this is something that uh, gets come we come back to in fossil talks a lot that like right now on earth there are millions of kinds of animals and yet we have fossils for like mere thousands of kinds of animal, including dinosaurs from hundreds of millions of years. And so there are so many creatures that existed that we don't even know. Like we may never find a fossil of them because fossilization is so hard. So very cool. Yes, and one of the things is like certain, certain habitats um, are um, more beneficial to fossilization. So forested floodplains, things in swamps, things near rivers, those are gonna be fossilized. But animals that were living in the mountains or deep in rainforests, we're never going to know whether they existed. I remember, remember reading somewhere that scientists think that we're only ever going to know about 1% of all life on Earth. That's crazy. Okay. All right. So for you guys, as kids, as scientists, if you go out, you are likely to find new species. We're finding new right. dinosaurs and new other species all the time. Um, all right, Miss Steinoff's class, if you guys want to come up, go for it. How long does it take to get a dinosaur to the museum? It can take a few years. So um, when we go out into the field to dig, for, the first step is prospecting. So we put on our backpacks, we get our equipment, and we basically just go hiking. And we go and we're looking for signs of fossils. Um, we're looking for the little, little fragments of bones that have eroded out of the hill. And then we follow those up the hill to find where the, um, the bone layer, where the fossil, where the bones and the fossils are coming from. After that, a lot of it is bureaucratic. We need to get per permits from the proper authorities. Um, the Bureau of Land Management is huge in that regard. They're very, very wonderful people who are very helpful. Um, and so after that, so the first permit we have to get is for the prospecting so that we can go out onto federal land to look for the fossils. Once we found the fossils, we mark the site. And then we, the next year, we can go back and get our permit saying, we can dig in the area and we can recover the fossils. And so once that happened, it could take, depending on the size of the fossil, it could take a few days and to a few, um, a few summers of constantly going back to the site and working on, working on recovering it. And then once we bring them back to the museum, it could be even a few more years of prepping out because we don't just pull the pull just the bone out of the earth. Um, it's surrounded by this kind of rock called the matrix. And we want to keep as much of that matrix around the bone during transport to help protect it. 
And so once we're in the um, lab, we use dental picks. We use these little things called pin vices, um, these things called air scribes, which are kind of like little um, air powered drills almost to get that matrix away and prepare the fossil for our researchers to study them, to put them on exhibit. Um, so yeah, so the pro it's a, it's a multi-year process from finding the fossil all the way up to having it fully out of the rock. Which is exactly why we have replicas on the table. So when they get knocked off, That's yes, oh, yeah, it work. Um, awesome. That's right. Um, all right, let's go to Miss Teason's class. You guys have been waiting patiently. Come on up. What dinosaur species? How many dinosaur species have you found in Canada? In Canada, I don't know an exact number off the top of my head, but especially in Western Canada, we have amazing um, fossil deposits. Um, in Kylosaurus, uh, like Martha's holding, the big club-tailed dinosaurs, we have Triceratops and its relative Taurosaurus, uh, Tyrannosaurus and Montosaurus, uh, big uh, uh, big duck-billed dinosaurs. So we have a lot of, um, uh, we have a there's a lot of really, really important dinosaurs that have helped us really learn a whole lot about them from Canada. And um, we even have some going up really far up north in Canada and, and Alaska as well. Um, Pachyrhinosaurus was found above the Arctic Circle. So we have evidence of dinos even dinosaurs living that far north. So Canada is a, um, British Columbia, Actually, just this past year, a new dinosaur was named by, by Victoria Arbor. She's a Canadian scientist who did a research fellowship here in North Carolina. So that was super exciting. It was, the, I believe, the first or second dinosaur found from um, British Columbia. It was a little ceratopsian, so a little dinosaur rel related to triceratops, but much smaller. Um, yeah, so Canada. Canada has a lot of really cool dinosaurs. Canada and the States, both both countries are, are really rich in fossil beds, and every year teams of scientists go to these places to find a huge variety of new species. Um, two quick notes. Uh, we've done several sessions with Victoria Arbor. She's oh, been, that's awesome. Uh, yes. Awesome with our kids at the end. Um, and I'm going to pass along a link to a, a creature called Borealopelta, which was this ankylosaurus, the one with a huge club on his tail. That's one of the most beautiful specimens ever found ever in the history of science. Uh, it's <laughs> absolutely, it looks like a dinosaur that just literally fell asleep. It does. It's absolutely yeah. gorgeously preserved. You should get a picture of it. We will, we will nerd out about it uh, later, but we'll dive back in with some classes. Okay. Uh, uh, so Ms. Pallison's class uh, also joining us uh, on YouTube. So they are coming in from, it wants to scroll. There we go. Grade threes in Kamloops in BC. And they wanted to ask, this is very subjective, but I like the question. What is the most dangerous dinosaur ever to exist? So that is a very um, subjective question. I T-Rex is probably definitely up there. Um, but T-Rex wasn't the only giant predatory dinosaur. We also had... Giganotosaurus from down in South America. We had Acrocanthosaurus, like we have in our museum. A Carcharodontosaurus, which was related to Acro and Giganota. Um, and Carcharodontosaurus's name actually means great white shark toothed lizard because its teeth kind of reminded scientists of that. And it lived in Africa. So we have a lot of really, um, we had a lot of big predatory dinosaurs. But the other thing is, we generally think of it was only the meat-eating dinosaurs that were dangerous. But herbivores, if we look at modern herbivores, the most dangerous animals in Africa are elephants and rhinos hippos. and hippos. Yeah. So herbivores like Triceratops and Kylosaurus, you probably wouldn't have wanted to mess with them either because they're definitely going to be able to defend themselves. Yeah. There's a great Just, picture right now posted by the Royal Ontario Museum where it's a, a researcher sitting between like an elephant thigh and a triceratops thigh. So you can get a sense of how huge these creatures would be. But, uh, you know, we had hippos covered earlier today and, and really dangerous. So great question, guys. Um, I'm actually going to run and grab a megalodon tooth in a minute because we like big teeth. But we got a question from Mr. Hancock's class, uh, Georgetown, Ontario, which fits in with our big scary dinosaurs that are meat eaters. Well, how big are these teeth getting, guys? Can you explain uh, how big T-Rex teeth might be? Yeah, so one of the really cool things with teeth is um, we can get so much information about them. Uh, just whether they're dinosaurs, modern animal teeth, human teeth, we can learn a whole lot of information. And one of the really cool things with Tyrannosaurus is, one, it had huge teeth. 
um, bar it varied in size throughout the body. But one of the things with T. rex that we can tell is it had the strongest bite force of any animal that's ever lived that we're aware of. And when you think of the kind of animals that it was coexisting with, triceratops that had that big um, bony frill and the long horns um, and chylosaurus, which was basically a walking army tank, having teeth that could crunch through bone is going to be super helpful when you're dealing with prey animals like that. Uh, we also have, but then the other thing is we can look at different types of teeth from different types of dinosaurs and we can see what kind of things they were eating. Uh, Spinosaurus uh, had very conical teeth that was very similar to a crocodile. And that kind of gave us a hint that it was had a more aquatic lifestyle and it was eating fish. Um, we have teeth from sauropods, so the big long necked dinosaurs like this, which are kind of scoop shaped and showing that they probably weren't chewing their food because they didn't have a lot of those flat grinding surfaces when compared to something like a uh, hadrosaur tooth, which had this big grinding surface um, to chew up its uh, to chew up its teeth or chew up its food. So yeah, so the biggest teeth probably belonged to the the meat eating T. Rex kind of dinosaurs, but teeth are super super valuable. We can learn so much from them. Also, we use teeth replicas. Yes, these are all replica teeth. <laughs> replica teeth. Awesome. All right. Uh, Miss Teeson's class has to go in a minute, so I want to bring them in uh, for a second question really quick, and then uh, you guys can head it right after. Go for it. Are there any animals on Earth that are like dinosaurs? That's an excellent question. So if we look at the, um, the evolutionary relationships of dinosaurs, dinosaurs are part of a group of animals called, called archosaurs. And their cousins, they're cousins to crocodiles. So crocodiles and dinosaurs long, 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 long time ago shared a common ancestor. And then they diverged. And one went to the crocodiles and one went to the dinosaurs. Uh, d uh, the other group that is alive today that is super similar to dinosaurs because they're related is birds. Birds are living dinosaurs. They're descended from small theropods. And if you look at the skeleton of meat-eating dinosaurs like Velociraptor, Microraptor, um, those small predatory dinosaurs, they're incredibly similar to birds. And you can even see it in the bigger ones like T-Rex and Acrocanthosaurus. They're very, the, the skeletons are so, so similar. And so in a very real sense, dinosaurs didn't become extinct. Uh, they live on as birds. Yeah, awesome guys, thank you so much. Okay, so we're getting to the end of what a typical session would be, but it's dinosaurs, so I wanna give us a little bit more time for some questions. If you guys are good awesome. for another five or so, that would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll really quickly show, this is a megalodon tooth too, so the biggest shark tooth ever to exist. Um, so very, very cool and not a replica, so I'll be very careful with it. Um, all right, let's dive in uh, back with uh, Miss McDonald's class. If you guys have another one, come on up. Um, Everyone's got a question. <laughs> and this is our last question. We unfortunately have to go for lunch, but thank no you worries. for having us. Yeah. What is a T-Rex's closest relative? So a T-Rex, so T-Rex are not one of the dinosaurs that evolved directly into birds. So they don't have any direct living ancestors, even though they're still, you know, they still being theropod dinosaurs are related to birds. But T-Rex's closest living relatives were other Tyrannosaurs. So there was a dinosaur called Despletosaurus and Albertosaurus, um, Maros, the, the dinosaur that Dr. Zano named, um, was an ancestor to T-Rex. So, so T-Rex had a family of dinosaurs that was very, very similar. Its closest relative was one from China and Mongolia called Tarbosaurus, which means alarming lizard because if you were to run into it, you'd probably be very alarmed. Um, but yeah, so, but again, their, their relatives, the birds do live on, even if they weren't directly um, leading into birds, the Tyrannosaurus. Uh, more for teachers than the students, but there's a really fantastic book out right now on Tarbosaurus or on a, on a skeleton called The Dinosaur Artist. So I really recommend that to you guys if you're keen on dinosaurs to, to share widely, it's fantastic. All right, let's go to our Illinois classes. So Mrs. Pospisil's class, 
If you guys want to come up first. Be loud. What's the first and second in Jurassic period? Can you repeat that one more time, please? What's the first insect in the Jurassic period? Insect in the Jurassic period. Oh, oh insect. Thank you. Okay. Insect. Um, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know that much about prehistoric insects, to be completely honest. Um, but if you're t if uh, you guys want to get your teacher, can always feel free to email us, and we can talk to some of the uh, entomologists here at the museum, and we can email her back in. Um, get an answer for you. Cool. Is that, can we find the email for that just off your website or do you want to share it with us and we can share oh, it? Okay. So okay. it's outreach at naturalsciences.org. Right. Perfect. Yeah. I will put that into the chat bar too. Perfect. Um, okay. Excellent guys. Worth noting for our classes as well, the period before the dinosaurs, Carboniferous, you get insects like millipedes that are six foot long and a foot off the ground. You get dragonflies that are the size of seagulls. You get some really, really cool creatures too. So uh, I'm glad an insect question you got brought up. Yes. All right, uh, Mr. Lindmark's class. Come on up, guys. Uh, okay. Um, how many um, fossils do you guys have? In our museum. Um, it's a, it's a, um, I remember hearing a million or something like that. We have a lot of fossils here at the museum. They're not all dinosaur fossils. Right. We have a huge... Um, invertebrate collection we have a lot of mammals whales mastodon things like that but i believe it's around a million it includes different species yeah. of sharks as well yes. so it's lots of different small small things drawers full of different fossil yes. specimens very cool all right um and then let's head to uh miss wait did <coughs> mr Lindmark. yes on, uh, yeah go for it <laughs> sorry <laughs> All right, we, do we get another question? Yeah, go for it. Sure. Oh, can, um, I go? can I go? Can I go? Yes. Oh, it's dinosaurs. <laughs> can I get down? Can I go? What's, wait. Yeah. Okay. What's your biggest dinosaur? What's the. Yeah, biggest one you guys have there at the museum. Okay. So, so the, on um, the biggest one on display is Acrocanthosaurus. It was about 40 feet long. Um, we have a few bigger ones, but um, they're just bits and pieces, not, um, yeah, the biggest dinosaur though, as of now, it's kind of, it, it changes a little bit every so often. The biggest dinosaur that scientists just in general know about uh, right now is Patagotitan. It's uh, the, titan, the Titan from Patagonia. Um, and it was a long-necked sauropod, kind of like this, and it was found a few years ago down in Patagonia in South America. And South America seems to be a hotbed for large titanosaur sauropods. Um, you have Patagotitan, you have Argentinosaurus, you have um, one called Dreadnoughtus, and they were easily getting, over, getting over, well over 100 feet long. Um, so it seems that... It just seems that South America was growing them big back then. <laughs> they sure were. Um, all right, Mr. Tongi's class. I know you guys are heading out. Everyone's heading out. I love it. It's like you guys are staying to the last dying second. So in Washington, if you guys have a question before you run away, you're welcome to do it. Um, but I don't know if your mic's working or if you're around or oh no. Okay, let's head to Miss Steinhoff's class then. We'll wrap up with that. I love the enthusiasm, guys. This is awesome. <laughs> Go for it. How heavy is a T Rex? How heavy? So it was it was a few tons. So T Rex, it's no longer the longest theropod. That title, um, it was about the same length as Acrocanthosaurus, Giganotosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and uh, Spinosaurus was much longer. But those four did not weigh as much as T Rex. T Rex was kind of like to you heavyweight boxer it the, yes it was yeah. a heavy it was like the line the line um linebacker. linebacker of the dinosaurs it was really solidly built it was very muscular dinosaur um and it was kind of relying like kind of like on brute force so it was a very heavy dinosaur it was it was several tons awesome um all right guys we could go all day so i want to confirm again outreach at naturalsciences.org yes yes, yes. okay 
Perfect. Well, I'll share that with all our classes when we're done. Uh, thanks for our, our classes for sticking around to the very end, guys. We really appreciate it. I know it's the end of the day for a lot of people at lunch, um, but this is a really fantastic session. So to both of you guys, thank you so much for a great presentation and for, for great Q&A. This is awesome. And hopefully we'll have like 100 plus questions to inundate your inbox with in just a, a few minutes when we're done. <laughs> Sounds um, great. <laughs> As you know, we end every session. I'm going to demute everyone's microphones. So for our class is still here, Ms. Steinhoff, Mr. Lindmark, Mr. Tongi's class, uh, boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to the team of the North Carolina Museum. Uh, you are all demuted. Go for it. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, guys. Um, we appreciate this so much, and we look so forward to having you guys back soon. That was awesome. That was Bye, fun. Everybody. Bye.